Hello, everyone, and welcome to Student Success. My name is Emmanuel Shield, and I am the instructor presenting this Student Success course at the Bahamas Technical and Vocational Institute. I am on the Freeport campus on the island of Grand Bahama. Welcome to the course. Let me tell you right up front that this course lasts for a period of seven weeks. And I meet with my students once per week. Okay, and when we meet, we spend just under two hours. So if you are able to calculate that, you'll realize that it's a short course and therefore we have to move at a fairly fast pace. Now at the same time, the content to be covered is not a whole large amount. We have probably, you could say, one topic per week for those seven weeks, maybe a little more. All right, so I invite you, if you are a student, adult learner, or somebody still in high school who has registered for this course, please come prepared mentally to move at the pace that we do move so that you can wrap this up within the seven weeks and be done with it, okay? I'll give you a little insight into what will be covered in the course and a bit about the layout of the course. So we will look at topics like personal responsibility, time management, goal setting, how to identify a potentially successful student, learning styles, motivation, different types of motivation, self-awareness, and study skills. Okay, those are the areas that we will look at over the period of seven weeks that we will spend together. Now, as it concerns how the course is graded and how it is monitored, I'll share those details with you right now. So the course is monitored and graded in the following ways. You have a grade for attendance at classes, okay? So there's a grade for your attendance at classes. You have a grade for participating in classes, okay? Not just to be there physically, but you, know, you have to also participate in whatever activities are taking place. During this course, you will be expected to reflect on the different topics that will be covered. Something handwritten, which you will later on type out and submit both versions into your final um, document, which I'm gonna say more about in a moment. Those weekly pieces are called reflections. They are graded, all right? Then, as additional classwork, I have some quizzes that I administer to students over the period of seven weeks. Usually I just go up to three quizzes. So it means that you will have a grade per quiz and you'll have those reflection grades. And in addition to that, during this seven week period, students are expected to get involved in some community service there are some forms to be filled out to um, provide evidence that you did get engaged and you are expected to cover 20 hours of community service. All right, so there will be a form that you get signed off on each time you go to the place that you go to do the voluntary community service work. And there's a second form that the person who you have who you would have gone to at whichever place you would have gone to, 
there's a form that they fill in to say what kind of person you showed yourself to be over the period that you came there to accumulate those 20 hours. And at the end of the course, there is that portfolio that you have to submit, which should contain all any and all pieces of work that you would have done throughout the period of seven weeks. In addition, at the beginning when you are just starting off, there is a questionnaire, a VARK VARK questionnaire that you are required to complete and print out and include it in your um, portfolio at the end of the course. So I'm asking you to bear these things in mind as you go forward. I almost forgot, there's another form that is called a student advisement form that you must fill in. This form carries personal information about you and therefore can be referred back to even after you have finished this course at BTVI as evidence also that you had passed through the Institute and, and would have completed student success. In case you are questioning what is the purpose of this short course, it is actually placed in the program so as to prepare you with the way you will handle your overall courses of study. Okay, so bear these things in mind as we proceed. All right, if I didn't say it before, my name is Emmanuel Shield and I will be your lecturer your instructor for the next seven weeks. Okay, welcome back. Now let us talk about, or let me share with you about the first of the list of topics that we'll cover. And the one I wanna start off with is personal responsibility. Personal responsibility. The two words being placed together already suggest to you what they mean. All right, but I'm going to read and share with you what you need to know as I have documented it in relation to that topic. Personal responsibility means that each student must become engaged in a determined manner so as to effectively complete whatever course of study they had undertaken and in life in general. So the course is preparing you to do well in your courses at BTVI, but by extension, it is also preparing you for the way you should approach life after having been given this opportunity. So consider yourself as a student. What are the realities that a typical student is faced with. A typical student is faced with classes to attend at a particular place, whether vertically or in a physical classroom on a campus. The student will be responsible for attending those classes and arriving early so as not to miss out on anything that the teacher may be presenting. The student will be responsible for completing any and all assignments or homework and to do so in the time allotted to get it done. Many times the teacher will give assignments or homework and attach a submission date to it. The student will need to have the work in before or by the deadline which had been set. Okay? In life, speaking generally, the same responsibilities are laid on each individual while they live. In other words, we are all personally responsible for how we relate and react to what transpires in our individual lives. We do not have control over the things that will transpire, but we can choose how we will react 
to them. Bear in mind that the natural unfolding of the other realities in your personal lives, that's those things that are not related to your studies, you will still have to relate to those things because none of them will change to suit the conditions of being a student, you know? Which means that you will be handling those personal realities as well as the realities of being a student. And you'll be doing that simultaneously. Sounds like more responsibilities on each of you as you undertake your studies. Choosing when to undertake studies is therefore something to be carefully contemplated before the decision is made. You don't want to start without giving it enough thought and then midstream you realize that you're unable to cope with both your studies and your other personal responsibilities. Okay, so if you need to go back and listen to this, what I just said another time, feel free to do so. All right. And before you move on to the next chapter, take a few moments and do an internal check on your reality as an individual and answer these questions. For example, are you hampered in any way by any disability at the present time? Because this will surely um, put some strain on what you are intending to undertake. Another question. Are you a parent at the present time, whether you are male or female? Are you pregnant at the moment? Are you holding down a nine to five job at the moment? Are you financially capable of handling the expenses that will accompany the studies that you are contemplating undertaking? Are you experiencing good health at the moment? Do you have adequate support let me say that again. Do you have an adequate support system in place to back you up with your domestic and personal situations, thereby enabling you to concentrate on your studies? Are you living in close proximity to the campus or do you have transportation to get to and from? Do you have access to internet and a computer at present? So those are some questions that you should answer before you even take on studies, especially if you are an adult. Okay? And the list of questions could be lengthened. But if you are able to respond to these questions in a positive way, then consider yourself ready to undertake your studies. So we were talking about personal responsibility and you could consider this chapter one in this document that I have prepared. After the break, I will continue with chapter two. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Student Success. We are about to venture into chapter two. And I have titled this chapter, Self-Awareness. I decided to speak on self-awareness following upon personal responsibility because they are very closely um, connected. Now here's what you need to contemplate and consider when you hear the term or the expression self-awareness. Self-awareness is being addressed right here, like I just said, after personal responsibilities because they are closely related. Self-awareness is the degree to which you keep your focus on who you are 
in every aspect of your being. Okay? What exactly do I mean by that? I mean that you are aware, for example, that you are poor. If indeed you are poor, you are aware that you are from a family that is pushing you with all it has to make you the first of its members to graduate from college. Okay? Self-awareness. You are aware that the people in the community that you are from are all betting on you to do well and to come out successfully. You are aware that you have a short attention span, if indeed you do. You are aware that you totally need to graduate with distinction in order to be considered for that position that you have been secretly dreaming about. And however, many other aspects of your reality that you can think of, you are challenged to remain aware of them, you know, as you undertake studies. The key thing is to be aware of them. Being aware of them will help you in making decisions as you move forward and engage in interactions with fellow students, teachers, and strangers that will cross your path along your academic journey. All right? But, but you may say, how? Oh, you know, how can you always remain self-aware? You know, what exactly does that mean? Consider this. Let us say you know that you're from a family that is rooting for you and supporting you because they need you to do well and make them proud, right? Being such a person, you will not stop to engage in a conversation with anyone who seems to be trying to lure you into an unplanned sexual escapade, for example. Right off the bat, you'd know that you did not come to BTVI to do that. Right? So you would not stop to engage in such a conversation. You will not allow yourself to be introduced to any activity that will cause you to lose time, which would be better spent focusing on your studies, right? We're talking about self-awareness. And there's not much more than that to be said on self-awareness. It's about being always focused on where you're from, what kind of people you're from, what your ambition is, what are their expectations of you, you know, what are your dreams for the future, and so on. And so now before I move on to the next chapter, I need you to consider this question. Who am I? And then answer that question in light of the several scenarios that have been mentioned in this chapter. Browse back through the chapter to remind yourself of the things that were mentioned and write down as much about yourself as comes to your mind. You could do that in, say, the next 10 minutes. It's a challenge that you should take, okay? Each student that reads or listens to this, I guarantee you that it will help you on this academic journey, okay? Stay tuned for Chapter 3. Welcome back to Student Success. Everyone, again, I am Mr. Shield, and you are at BTVI, Freeport Campus, Grand Bahama, the Bahamas. This is our third chapter in our seven-week course, and the content I'm going to talk about in this chapter is motivation. 
motivation. How about it? How much do you know about motivation? The term motivation refers to whatever pushes or drives an individual to get up and get things done. It has to do with the human will and sense of purpose, okay? As humans, we are all faced with choices to make every moment of our lives, just as we are presented with opportunities of one sort or another. I believe you would agree with me where that is concerned. Motivation is directly linked with our energy levels and our personal vibe for life. Do you want to be up and about getting things done? Or do you want to just stay in one place and watch the world go by? That question is talking about motivation. And each of us needs to know what motivates us. But let me continue. As it is, we are either naturally driven by a force inside of us to get up and go get things done, wonderful things, or we get that overwhelming desire to get up and go and get wonderful things done as a result of seeing the world around us and other individuals getting up and going out and getting those wonderful things done. So you are either motivated naturally from the inside or by viewing the works and um, success of somebody else in your environment, okay? When the desire is from inside of you and you are naturally driven, that type of motivation is called intrinsic motivation. When the desire and the drive is developed as a result of observing the world and other individuals doing wonderful things successfully, the motivation is called extrinsic motivation. Know the difference between the two, okay? The person who imitates another person or is motivated by what the other person does may be disappointed in the event that the other person, the external motivator, eventually fails at whatever they were doing. Okay, that's for the extrinsically, extrinsically motivated individual. On the other hand, the person who is internally motivated has the opportunity to reassess their passions and drive in their situation and make the necessary adjustments without anyone even having the slightest idea that they could have failed had they not made those adjustments. All right, so I give greater kudos to the person who is internally motivated because they have the opportunity to make adjustments to what they are doing in order to make sure that at the end of the day, they come out being successful. All right? Now I want you to ask yourself, are you doing the things that you do because you naturally enjoy doing them and have a strong passion for them, whatever it is? Or are you merely doing what you do as a way of trying to fit in with the society that you happen to live in? That's a question that every student of student success should answer. And indeed, everybody in this world, do you do the things that you do because you have a strong passion for them on the inside? Or do you do them because that's what the people around you all seem to be doing? Question to be answered. All right. You could write down your answer or you could just mull it over in your mind and make your decision about where you stand. All right. Whichever way it goes, your answer to that question will help you to understand whether you are intrinsically motivated or 
extrinsically motivated. All right. You may want to listen to this again before you, you know, make your decisions. So I want you to assess yourself right now. Here, here's a question. What do you do, say, for a living? What do you do? You know, what career path have you been following? Is it a career or a mere job? Okay. If you lost that job, would you feel like your world is coming to an end? Or would you use your time while searching for a new job, doing something else that you happen to enjoy doing? Why, if your answer is yes, you would be involving yourself with things that you, you naturally love to do. This next question comes to mind right away. Why aren't you dedicating all of your time doing that thing that you are doing between jobs? You know, I want you to really spend some time thinking about these questions that I just um, read before you move on to reading or listening to the next chapter. Stay tuned. I will be right back. Welcome back, students. Welcome back, student success students. I'm Mr. Shield, and we are moving on. One of the other things that you have to take into consideration as a student, not only of student success, but of any kind of studies that you undertake, is the whole reality of the way you manage your time. Okay? Time management, and I'm going to tie that in with goal setting because the two of them go hand in hand. If you are poor at managing your time, it doesn't matter how nice the goals are that you set, more than likely they will not be executed effectively and achieved. So here's what I have prepared for the class. Okay? These two concepts really need to be understood clearly by not just students, but every human being. That is if they are going to be, you know, successful at anything that they do. All right. When it comes to student life, it is even that more important and needs to be even more clearly understood. That's the whole business of time management, managing time and setting goals and achieving them. So let us talk a little bit about it. And I'm doing it in a simplistic, clear-cut way. The day, the typical day has 24 hours in it. And the work week has basically five days on which schools and other institutions of learning operate. It may be different in some places, but generally speaking, okay? That is the first thing that a student must come to grips with. Mondays to Fridays are school days, and each day has 24 hours. 12 or so of those hours are daylight time, and the other 12 are what we call night, where people rest. Okay. The second thing students need to know and accept is that for every day, there is a night. And that after humans use the daylight hours of each day, attending to work and studies, they need to spend the nights sleeping, resting, and recuperating in preparation for the next day. This means that nights are to be used to benefit from the sleep and rest that they are meant to afford humans. Hmm? And there, you know there's a reason why I'm stressing that. Failure to sleep because of a hectic party lifestyle or hanging out with friends, doing whatever they feel like doing, will not work out well 
with the schedule that a student should be following. Engaging in activities such as alcohol consumption or overindulgences of any kind that will impair the sharpness of the senses will not work well for any student. Students who engage in such activities, students who engage in such activities will find it impossible to arrive at classes early or even on time. They will not be able to concentrate on classwork and naturally their interest will wane, gradually get less and less over time until it is completely gone, leaving them in a condition that will make it impossible to pass any course or be successful at anything. Okay? And that is why there is usually a dropout rate in institutions around the world. A particular number of persons registered at the outset to undertake a course of study. And by the time it gets around to the middle of the course, you realize that you are no longer seeing certain persons in class. I'm not saying there cannot be life situations that come up which are not brought on by carelessness. Those do happen, but many dropouts happen as a result of poor time management where persons indulge in like a lot of partying, you know, nightlife activities and overindulgence in other stuff. Okay. All right. So let me continue. And please note what I have been saying so far, because, um, Studying is something to be taken seriously. Managing time, therefore, means that you should lay out on a paper or on a device exactly how each of your daylight hours on each of the school days are going to be spent. Making sure to allot time for each course being undertaken. It's not hard to do. A lot of time also for studying, for attending classes, and for completing assignments, right? You have to do it. If you don't do it, you are more likely to slip up and forget and then run the risk of failing at what you do. All of this has to be dealt with even while you keep schedules for your regular life responsibilities. Okay, so um, when suggestions are made, let's say you have friends, when suggestions are made, you know, in group settings for socializing to take place, each student must carefully assess whether they can be a part of the gathering. Okay. Whenever activities of a frivolous nature are happening anywhere in the space traversed by the student, they must make the decision to avoid getting caught up in such activities so as to reserve their energy and time for their studies. Mind you, that is if the student is interested. Because with all of these things, it comes down to whether individually we are interested. All right. So you may ask, why, why is time management so important? It is important primarily because as a student, there is a timeline along which every activity needs to be carried out and completed. Okay. That's why institutions have timetables and course outlines and course schedules and stuff like that. They have to be followed. The institution itself has a particular amount of time within which to present the course so that they can move on to other courses. All right? So time management cannot be overemphasized. All right? Everything has to be managed along a timeline. And each activity that a student is faced with need to be seen as a small goal being achieved. 
right? Which will then eventually lead to the much larger goal of completing the studies of the program that was undertaken. So let us say you're, you're in a, an institution, you have signed up for a program of study that has 10 courses in it, okay? You now must sit down and critically budget your time and say, okay, the week only has five um, school days. I need my weekends for whatever else. So let me try to fit all the things that are connected to these courses into these five days and a portion of each of the nights, right? And you not only set these things in place, you have to abide by them. It's no use setting out a nice timetable saying what you are going to do and when you are going to do it, but then you turn around and forget that you, are, you had even made up such a timetable. You have to abide by your timetable, which is the time management part of it, and it is by so doing that you will end up achieving the goals that you have set. All right? So wherever time management is mentioned, Goal setting follows. Humans, students alike, operate on timelines in order to achieve goals. Goals that eventually lead them to graduating where they are a student and experiencing the success dreamt about at the outset. In life, the small plans that you make lead to the eventual success at the end of your days as well. This student reality, which is of time management and goal setting, cannot be overemphasized because wherever programs of studies are offered, all types of people labeled as students simply because they registered with the institution will show up with all of their character traits and personalities, right? And can really negatively or positively impact the lives of each other. Classrooms can be a buzz of activities that do not effectively align with what a teaching and learning environment should be, okay? As the myriad of personalities compete to prioritize what is important to them, right? And we know that distractions come in all forms. As a student, you have to be aware of these things and put all the energy that is required into not getting absorbed or sucked in to that world, okay? You have to basically always remember why you are in class, why you signed up for this study and all of that all right and as we wrap up this chapter i need you to think about how you have been managing your time you know how have you been when it comes to goal settings and achieving them if you find that you have been doing poorly in that regard kindly start writing down the things that you need to do in order to improve in those areas and to be successful, all right? You may need to listen to this chapter again to benefit from it in the maximum way, all right? But stay tuned. I will be right back with another chapter. All right, this is Mr. Shield at BTVI with Student Success. Welcome back to Student Success at BTVI with Mr. Shield. In this chapter, we are going to talk a little bit about learning styles. Learning styles are very important. And that is why we're gonna spend some time talking about them. Okay, so you may ask right off the bat, what are learning styles? And the answer is, learning styles has to do with the sense or senses that each learner uses naturally 
to absorb and interact with the teaching learning environment. That sensors, those senses that they use to enable them to assimilate what is being presented by the teacher each time they meet in the teaching and learning environment. Okay. All right. It is the sense that they utilize in their effort to grasp content and materials as they are presented. Some students are keen listeners, and these are viewed as oral learners. That's A-U-R-A-L, oral learners, because they use the auditory senses, okay? These students only need to hear what is presented in their lectures in order to store the information as long-term memory. All right, so those are the oral learners. Some students have the need to see everything that the teacher does in order to store information as long-term memory. Those are called visual learners. All right, as you're listening, you should be checking yourself to see what it has been for you. All right. So these visual learners, they need to see everything that the teacher does in order to store information as long-term memory. All right. A third set of learners known as the tactile or the kinesthetic learners, they have the need to be physically interacting with the material being presented in order to create and store the information as long-term memory. All right, so we have mentioned three so far. But there's a fourth. And there, this fourth learning style, which many persons may consider people with them to be geniuses, this learning style is called the eclectic style, E-C-L-E-C-T-I-C, -E -E the eclectic learning style, and is manifested by the student who is able to learn by using multiple senses simultaneously, okay? This type of student learn by listening, seeing, and interacting physically all at the same time. And where the other senses of tasting and smelling are needed, they get used as well. So you could say such a student is firing off all cylinders, you know. They seem to make light matters of whatever the course of study is because they just happen to show up and they are learning through every sense that they were born with, right? Unfortunately, not everybody is like that, which is why we're able to um, single out the others that we have mentioned before, like the oral and the visual and the tactile learners, okay? Yes, yeah, so this, this eclectic student learns by listening, seeing, and interacting physically all at the same time. And if, it, if the course of study includes the need to taste and smell, they are right there as well, being able to store long-term memory by those senses. In a classroom setting, the sense that is utilized by students will determine where they choose to sit for lectures. The oral learner may be comfortable in the middle of the room or even at the back of the room. As long as he or she is able to hear what the teacher is saying from there, okay? The visual learner, on the other hand, will want to be up at the front of the class so as to see everything that the teacher does, including facial feature changes, hand movements, and other body language, okay? And the third one now, the tactile learner will also feel the need to be up close to the teacher, but not only to see, as it is with the visual learner. The tactile learner wants to be up there in order to be afforded the opportunity to physically 
interact with whatever material is being shared with the class, okay? So let us say as part of the lesson, the teacher is doing a demonstration and he or she is putting together an assembly, right? Or making a model or so on to bring the lesson out. This tactile learner would want to be up there, maybe even assisting in the putting together and the pulling down of the model, you know, in order to create long-term memory of the lesson. Now the eclectic learner will be comfortable anywhere in the classroom. The reality, however, is that with the variety of personalities and characters present in any single classroom, things may not be as clear cut as outlined here. For example, the tactile learner may arrive late on an occasion and fail to get a seat at the front of the classroom. Reality is reality. The oral learner may choose to sit at the back of the classroom only to discover that there is too much cross-talking going on in the class for him or her to hear anything that the teacher is saying at the front. Okay? The visual learner may find that he is unable to see the teacher because of constant moving about by other students. So these realities exist, right? especially where the class is made up of a chaotic group of students. The eclectic learner with all his capabilities could still find it challenging to get the most out of a lesson where the group is chaotic, which drives home the point that focus on the part of every student is vitally important and must be maintained throughout studies. And this leads me to the next chapter in which I will talk about study skills. I invite you to stay tuned. I will be right back. All right, welcome back, student success, students. We are getting closer to the end of the material that I prepared for this course. And in this chapter, we are going to talk about study skills. So far, we have discussed personal responsibility, self-awareness, types of motivation, time management and goal setting, and learning styles. And now we are about to talk about study skills. Study skills are those things that students engage in as a way of guaranteeing that the material and content that they are exposed to in classes is, is um, effectively retained by them so that they can do well on examinations. Let me say that again. Study skills are those things that students engage in as a way of guaranteeing that the material and content that they are exposed to in classes are, are effectively retained so that when they need it, such as in examinations to respond to questions, they are able to draw back on those things mentally and produce good work. These skills include the making of personal notes, paying full attention at all times during classes, tuning out distractions of all sorts by switching into what I refer to as student mode, engaging in collaborative studies with other students, capturing all notes that are shared formally by the teacher and reviewing immediately following each lesson and frequently afterwards. Let me say those again. Study skills include making personal notes, paying full attention at all times, 
tuning out distractions of all sorts by switching into what I refer to as student mode, engaging in collaborative studies with other students, capturing all notes which are shared formally by the teacher, and reviewing immediately following each lesson and then frequently afterwards. Those are study skills that work universally, okay? In addition to those practices outlined here so far, the student who wants to succeed as a student will approach the reviewing of class notes one paragraph at a time. That's when you're studying now. The student will take on one paragraph at a time and then after reading the paragraph a few times, they will create questions about that paragraph and then attempt to answer those questions, okay? When the student is able to rightly answer all of the questions that he or she created, that paragraph should be left alone and another paragraph reviewed so that the process of creating questions may be repeated, okay? Bear that in mind. Students should take breaks as necessary so as not to overly stress themselves. And it is never advisable to engage in studying on the night or morning right before an examination, right? Studying at the last minute tend to lead students to panic, which forces them into trying to memorize word for word all of the notes that they were given in their classes, right? And um, for those of us who may have been caught in this, what you will find out is that your attempt to memorize word for word will result in a scary situation in that if you ever end up forgetting one of those words, your effort to try to remember that missing word will only cause you to end up forgetting more words. And at long last, you'll find out that you really don't remember anything at all that you would have um, prepared for at the last moment. Back in our days in high school, we referred to that process as swatting, S-W-A-T-T-I-N-G, swatting. There is a big difference between swatting and studying. Do not get confused about the two. All right? All right, so let me move on. So students should take breaks as necessary so as not to overly stress themselves. And it is never advisable to engage in studying on the night or morning right before the exam. Studying at the last minute tend to lead students to panic, which forces them into trying to memorize word for word all of the notes as they were given in their classes. On the other hand, those students who would have paid full attention during lessons will tend to hear the voice of their teacher in their head as they review their notes in preparation for their exams, making excessive reviewing unnecessary. You know, so by the time they glance down on the formal F-O-R-M-A-L notes that they would have made as given by the teacher, as they are glancing at that, it's as if they are able to hear the teacher in their head breaking it down, simplifying it the way he would have done during the actual class time. Big difference between trying to memorize word for word. All right. It should be noted that the senses come into play here. Right? We're talking about study skills. So... As a result, some students, like the oral learners, they may choose to record their notes and then listen to the notes through headphones or even large speakers, okay? 
while others such as the visual learners may be okay reading over and over their notes until they grasp everything. The tactile learners may want to create or recreate the models and mockups that they may have seen the teacher do in class as a way of reinforcing the long-term memory in their mind in preparation for their examinations and so on. All right? So you may need to listen this again. Pause and listen until you have grasped everything that I have presented in this chapter. All right. And so having discussed study skills, we are now ready to review the signs to look for to identify a potentially successful student. And that's, where that's what we are going to look at in our next chapter. All right. So let us move on to that chapter which incidentally is going to be our final chapter in this document, all right? Stay tuned, I will be right back. Welcome back to Student Success. I am Mr. Shield, instructor at BTVI Freeport Campus, Grand Bahama. I say that proudly. Now let us look at our final chapter in this student success course. The topic we are going to be discussing here is identifying the successful student. Now, how can you look at a student and just say, this one looks like he has the potential to be successful or that one looks like it's not likely that he or she will be successful. Let us take a listen. All right. One of the first signs to look for is this. Potentially successful students arrive early for classes. Not just on time. They arrive early, right? This early arrival is important as it allows the students some time to relax and unwind from whatever the day had been like prior to getting into the teaching and learning environment and to get mentally prepared for the lesson, okay? Arriving early also makes it possible for the student to choose the best seat for them based on their learning style, okay? Second sign to look for to identify as potentially successful student is this. They arrive at class prepared for the lesson by ensuring that they take with them all the required tools and instruments for the particular lesson. Preparation for the class includes also a determined effort to push all unrelated matters from the forefront of their minds in order to make effective focusing possible. All right? Number three, this type of student deliberately avoids distractions. Even when it is their friends who are being potential distractions, they will avoid them for the purpose of getting the most of the class, out of the class. In other words, such students will adopt what I term flip mode, F-L-I-P-M-O-D-E. Okay, and what is flip mode? It is the ability to switch off or totally tune out everything that is not related to the matter at hand, okay? Because upon entering the classroom, the matter at hand becomes grasping the lesson contents and concepts. So for these people, even if it's their best friends that want to play the fool and be engaged in other things while the teacher is presenting, they will tune them out they try to get their attention, they will 
pretend as if they can't hear them as long as class is going on. Yes, at the end of class, they get back to friend mode and they can get back into the gallivanting and the, the laughter and the fooling around. In class, you switch mode, go into student mode, flip mode, and tune them out. Okay? Number four, potentially successful students, they choose their seat based on their learning style as mentioned in number one above and will relocate around the room as the lesson proceeds based on the atmosphere in the classroom, which means even if they had chosen a good vantage point to benefit from the lesson, but Idlers, as I want to just call them loosely, if they find that, you know, idlers are moving around and blocking their view in that position, they may find that they have to relocate in the classroom to find another good vantage point. And this may be repeated throughout the lesson where the teacher doesn't intervene and get those who are moving about carelessly to stop doing so. All right, so they may need to reposition and relocate depending on the restlessness if there is restlessness in a particular class all right so like i said if other students are behaving restless presenting the possibility of obstructing these students um, vision and their ability to hear they will have to keep moving so as to be always in a position to benefit the most from the lesson you know, in the most effective manner. Number five, and we have seven of them, so we're almost done. Potentially successful students, they make personal notes. These are things that we would have mentioned in the different chapters as we came along. But we're summing up here in chapter seven. How do you identify such a student? They make personal notes. In other words, they don't just rely on what the teacher tells them to write down. They write down stuff that they know will help them to remember a greater amount of content. Right? So they make personal notes as the teacher deliberates and they find crystal clear understanding of portions of the subject content. Right? Additionally, they take down all notes presented by the teacher and they review these notes immediately following each lesson and then frequently thereafter all right this practice makes it possible for the student to hear as it were the actual voice of the teacher in their head as they review thereafter you notice i have repeated that that reality we're paying attention in class when it comes time to review it's like you can seriously hear the voice of the teacher saying the things in their words it can be different from how it's written in the notes but you are hearing their voice when you read the notes number six sign of a potentially successful student they try their best to eat healthy, they try their best to eat healthy and get adequate amount of rest at night so as to be fully alert and aware during classes. Can't be overstated. They also avoid developing unhealthy habits such as alcoholism, drug abuse, and any other overindulgence that could cause a mind-altering effect on them. Mind-altering there means you have a desire to stay awake, but you can't because something in your system is not allowing you to. Okay? From can't keep your eyes open to can't hear clearly to can't retain more than three words. If you are in that state, your mind has been altered by something that you gave greater attention to 
than the studies that you're attempting to undertake. Don't fall into that trap. And the final sign of a potentially successful student is this one. They endeavor to complete all assignments within the time allotted for them to be completed and they submit their work for marking. Okay? So I just shared seven signs of a potentially successful student. And this brings me to the end of the presentation. With this information, you should be that successful student and individual that you have dreamt of becoming. All right? I trust that I impacted your life in even a small way as I shared the content of this student success course. I thank you for having stayed the time and I hope that you will see the effects of this short course on your work as you continue to undertake your studies here at BTVI. Again, as I close, I am Emmanuel Shield, lecturer, instructor here at the Freeport campus of the Bahamas Technical and Vocational Institute, BTVI. All right, I wish you every success, not only in your studies here at BTVI, but in your life in general. God be with you, and I will see you around. Blessings.